Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Laura Belmani. I'm the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Human Sciences. And we welcome you to our ongoing series, uh, the Dean's Forum on Living with a Pandemic. Uh, last semester, we had three really rich sessions with, uh, in collaboration with the College of Science. And this, uh, this uh, semester, we are continuing with the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences and uh, Pamplin College of Business. Um, we're going to keep this kind of free flowing today. Um, our panelists have been given some guiding questions about uh, the impact of COVID relevant to their fields of expertise and um, some assessment of how their fields can contribute to our understanding of the pandemic. And then more uh, broad questions on the role of a land grant institution in dealing with the pandemic and the most important long-term consequences we foresee of COVID and any lessons we have learned from the future. But I'll begin in the order of our roundtable participants listed here. Um, Anna Zeta is an associate professor of history and founding director of the food studies program in the College of Liberal Arts and Human Sciences. She studies food as a way of understanding environmental change, dynamic cultural practices, consumer behavior, technology, health, and justice. So take it away, Anna. <clears throat> Hi, everyone, um, and thanks for joining us. Um, as Dean Belmonte said, my name is Anna Zeta, and I'm new to Virginia Tech this year, <clears throat> coming to join the history department and to help build this food studies program. Um, my own research is um, quite interdisciplinary. I have a PhD in um, the history of science, medicine, and technology. Um, and so think a lot about food through lenses, not only of history, but sort of how it interacts with science, health, um, technology, consumer behavior, and other issues, but more from the kind of hum history and humanities dimensions, um, though often with a great interest to thinking about history <clears throat> as it informs the present. Um, and the food studies program that we have been building this year is intended to sort of reflect that very transdisciplinary focus to bring together people from all across campus and all colleges and the wider um, community who think about food through these many lenses to bring us into conversation together. So this <clears throat> forum is very in line with the kinds of work and connections I've been trying to make this year um, to talk across our usual um, department or college boundaries to think about questions like COVID and, and many others through multidisciplinary lenses. So um, I'm excited to um, have this chance to have this conversation with the other panelists and um, with all of you who are in attendance. Terrific. And our next panelist will be William Becker, an associate professor in the Department of Management in the Pamplin College of Business, who researches emotions related to organizational behavior, turnover, leadership, organization identification, and human resources management. William. Thanks, everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all, all about this. Again, as you said, a lot of my work has been in emotions, organizational neuroscience, done a lot of work on uh, work email and how it's intruding on in our lives. And now that's become even more uh, crazy with COVID. And so we've actually participated in three different studies during COVID that have kind of looked at this shift to teleworking and working out of our homes uh, seven days a week. And uh, some pretty interesting findings. Two of them are actually related to loneliness. We've looked uh, specifically at how lonely people are. And uh, in the one first study we did on that, we found that uh, work loneliness led to a lot of uh, burnout, depression, uh, insomnia, anxiety. And that was even true for people who are living with their significant others and families, uh, that, that people were really missing their work relationships and they play a big part in our lives. Uh, so on one hand, people really liked the freedom and the flexibility, but uh, there was still some things missing. And so um, we followed up with that and, and found another study found uh, again that loneliness was also related to lower performance and lower creativity uh, during COVID. And that it was actually worse for people who were more mindful and practice more mindfulness. And we, and we thought that was really interesting because mindfulness is usually kind of put out there as something to help us, um, you know, by focusing on the present and staying present. But when the present is pretty difficult, maybe that's not the best thing. So that was a pretty interesting study. 
And then the last one, we uh, again saw that uh, people's emotional demands are going up a lot during COVID. Um, and that was causing a lot of um, burnout, emotional exhaustion. Um, but uh, some good news in this one, we found that uh, leadership played a huge role and that if people had leaders who were really helping them, who were emotionally intelligent leaders who kind of encouraged them to reappraise the situation and, and use uh, these kind of tactics, that people did better, they were less exhausted um, and they actually ended up helping each other more. So um, across three studies, you know, a lot of really interesting things that sort of um, showed the, the benefits, but also the long-term consequences and that, it, you know, this new reality, we're gonna have to really think and that leadership's gonna play an even bigger role and that we're gonna have to find a way to still reconnect with people. So I think that's gonna be an interesting future. So looking forward to the, talking more about that during this forum today. Absolutely, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, next we have John Bovet, an assistant professor in the Department of Agricultural and Applied Economics in the College of Archite Agriculture, excuse me, and Life Sciences, who specializes in food and agricultural policy. Thanks, Dean Belmonte, for having me here um, and for the invitation from, from the whole group who organized the session. Um, I'd just like to say that I'm really interested in reading some of the work that Anna and William have done. It seems like it seems like really interesting just personally, but also connected to my own work, um, less so with William, for sure, in terms of my research. But um, I mean, work-life balance and stress from having to respond to 16 emails an hour. Um, it's pretty, um, I mean, it's relatable to all of us, I think. So um, as Dean Belmonte said, I'm, I'm an assistant professor. I just joined Virginia Tech about 18 months ago and my um, research focus is on uh, food and agricultural policy. Um, I also I have a 50% research, 50% extension appointment. And this semester I've been busy um, organizing a workshop on, um, it's called Virginia Sustainable Farms and Agribusiness um, Education Initiative. And so there's about one or two sessions a week covering various aspects of sustainability. Um, my, um, my research focus for the past year or so has been um, largely on the impacts of COVID on um, Virginia farms and agribusinesses and also on US trade and agricultural commodities. But um, taking a longer term view, um, I've, I've done a ton of work over the years on food safety, food labeling and food waste. Um, so I think that's, that's a good enough introduction and I, I look forward to saying more about what I've done. Excellent. And last but not least, we have uh, Jonathan Van Senten, an assistant professor in the Department of Agricultural and Applied Economics, who works in the Virginia Seafood Agricultural Research and Extension Center in Hampton. His primary focus is on aquaculture, aimed at understanding and quantifying the costs and impacts of the regulatory environment at the farm level. Thank you, Dean Belmonte, and all of those today and for organizing this session and inviting me to participate. Um, yes, like, uh, like John, my colleague in Ag and Applied Economics, I also have a 50-50 research extension appointment. Um, so working very closely with industry uh, throughout the state and the region to address ongoing issues. And so certainly with uh, the onset of the pandemic, forced to kind of change gears and shift focus into all of these new issues that were emerging at the production level, the marketing level, uh, you know, affecting the seafood sector here in Virginia and beyond. Um, you know, specifically, and, and I guess I can talk about it a little bit more in detail as we go through some of the discussion points, but I've been involved with a, uh, well, leading the national impact assessment of COVID on the aquaculture sector for the US. Um, that's something that we geared up really quickly to do at the start of the pandemic last year based on feedback from stakeholders in the industry. And so we've been summarizing the effects quarterly and providing that data um, to, the, to our industry stakeholders, but also state and federal stakeholders at agencies that were informing relief programs uh, for COVID. And so uh, that's been my, my direct involvement. But even now going forward, um, you know, several initiatives in progress, looking at changing consumer behaviors, changing preferences, for seafood in the uh, recovery phase of getting out of the pandemic and moving forward, uh, you know, which of these changes are permanent, which of these were temporary, and what other preferences are shifting 
in terms of uh, folks' behaviors and preferences. So uh, that's all work that we're involved with through the Seafood ARAC. So thank you for having me here today. Well, this is going to be a really interesting conversation. So I think the let's begin with the first question and you can chime in in the same order or not, whichever you prefer. What is the greatest impact of COVID relevant to your fields of expertise? And you can talk about research, teaching and outreach here. Anna, you want to begin? Sure. Um, well, I think, you know, hearing what the other panelists are working on, as a historian, at least when it comes to research, my my the work I've been working on this year has a lot less directly to do with COVID. I haven't, you know, shifted my research paths to study the present from studying the past. But I think one of the things that has really become clear in the last year, especially as it relates to food, is and and actually to relates to so many other aspects of our society, is that there are so many sort of invisible, at least to the public. Um, modes and systems and networks that have become more visible, whether that's thinking about issues of inequality, issues of you know, failing public health infrastructure, issues of food supply chains. Um, and it's very much that's what the historical work that I do also tries to uncover is how much <clears throat> these systems that have been built over centuries and in some cases really do underlie um, the awareness of the present day food system. So. Um, my first book was about the, um, the canning industry in the US and the way that processed food emerged um, and emerged in relationship with institutions of higher education, scientific research and public health infrastructure and how those foundations in the canning industry laid, laid you know, the, the path for the food system into the present. Um, right now I'm working on a broad um, US history right? um, through food, through 15 foods project. And, um, you know, although I'm spending a lot of time like in the <clears throat> um, revolutionary period or in early America, I'm seeing that the kinds of research I'm doing lays bare many of the same kinds of um, visibility that the COVID-19 pan pandemic has done for the food system. And so as I think about, you know, teaching and outreach in the food studies program, thinking about how these disconnections that consumers have often to the sources of their food production um, are, are made visible when you have things like, you know, a run on different supplies, when consumers have to think about why is it that there isn't flour or yeast or other products in our grocery stores. And the way that we see, you know, a corresponding increase in sort of at-home production processes, where whether it's you know a boom on canning jars and um, and seeds and sourdough starter and all of these things, you know, I think it, it's on the one hand kind of this interesting cultural phenomenon, and we wonder is it you know just going to go away? And at the same time, you see that that similar kind of effort to reclaim food production in the home characterizes many other periods of crisis, whether it's after the recession in 2008, other earlier um, moments where people feel like they're sort of out of control, um, whether it's, you know, economically or in terms of their health, and they look for control to carve out spaces where they can, you know, make, make more connection with their food production practices. And I think that that holds a lot of really interesting insights into what people's relationship to food, how it is fundamental, even as I think the 21st century food system disconnects people from you know, food production. Something about the pandemic has, I think, articulated um, the, the way that reclaiming some of those connections to food production gives people um, a sense of reassurance in, un, in uncertain times. Um, but also very much you know, highlighted, as with so many other things, the inequality that exists, that even as some are baking sourdough and you know, joining CSAs and other things, we also have unprecedented issues of food, food insecurity and 37 million Americans who are facing food scarcity. Um, and that those both exist within, you know, within our American food system and are, are both fundamentally you know, tied to political responses to pandemic and other moments of crisis. Thank you, Anna. William. Yeah, I think, you know, it's been really interesting, especially as this dragged on. I think at first, you know, obviously everyone would just one day they were working at home, right? And um, at first that was good and people had stuff to work on and they felt comfortable. But I think as yeah, our research has suggested, as the pandemic has kind of dragged on, we see that a lot of 
leaders particularly aren't really well equipped to um, guide and manage people over distance, right? There's so many, you know, those folks who gotten by being micromanagers and, you know, popping in on their employees all the time and keeping check on them have really struggled as, as the pandemic's gone on. And so I think, you know, good leadership has really shown through, but also bad leadership has on, on a, as things have dragged on also shown through. So I think you see a lot of companies struggling uh, to, to continue to direct their people and guide their people and get things done as things have dragged on. And so, um, and I think on the worker side, we see a lot of people who really, you know, at, at first in the first weeks thought, hey, this is great. I don't have to go in, I don't have to go to these meetings. And, um, but now as it's dragged on, they start to, again, start to miss those work relationships and they miss, and we're all so tired of Zoom that, you know, Zoom just isn't the same, right? Like, so getting together with your colleagues and, and sharing those, those personal relationships, but also having those creative sessions, talking about where are we going? What can we do with these products and where, where are the new trends? So I think we've seen a lot of um, industries kind of stagnate or try to struggle with those things. Um, so I, you know, I think now we're moving hopefully to the phase where, where there, there will be a new norm. And, and I think you know, some people have said it's gonna be, oh, all telework, all telework. But I think we're seeing that that's not really it either, that we need to have this blend of um, allowing people to work at home and have flexibility and balance their lives. But then also we do need to come together in groups and establish relationships and whether that's with clients, whether it's with coworkers, all those things that we, we so I think we're gonna see a really you know, unique blend where companies who embrace the, the, the positive lessons we learned and also capitalize on you know, what did people miss and how do we kind of blend those things. And I think we'll really see uh, companies that can capitalize on those lessons do well and others probably struggle. So again, I think it's exciting times as we kind of hopefully head into the new, new uh, reality. Absolutely. As someone who survived 264 Zoom meetings last semester, <laughs> yes. it's on track to exceed that. I can attest that it is slowly killing my soul. <laughs> so let's hope it's not the paradigm moving yes, forward. <laughs> exactly. Jonathan. Yeah, I, I actually, I you know, I, I agree with both what what William and, and Anna had to say. You know, coming, I mean, I'm looking at this through the you know, very, very narrow lens of, of the seafood industry that I'm so embedded with through my work. But, you know, for us on the research end, I mean, clearly COVID did create several disruptions of, of ongoing activities. Um, and, and like I said, forced us to kind of, you know, shift the focus to, to some of the other issues. But, you know, it's interesting to hear them talk about their work and then trying to put that into the context of what, what's affecting the seafood sector. In the U.S., traditionally, seafood is majority consumed outside of the home. Uh, so, you know, with the closures of businesses and restaurants, food service, all these other impacts, that really affected the seafood industry uh, very negatively. Um, and, and, you know, that now has all these ripple effects throughout the production process. And I think it's interesting because, you know, to the point about relationships, you know, the, the traditionally, seafood markets are really built around relationships. People working together, families that know each other historically, going back a long ways, you know, and so this has been kind of a real big challenge for them, and that's feeding through in, into our work as well, in trying to identify new marketing opportunities and changing market channels. You know, the seafood being so highly perishable as a product doesn't lend itself well to online sales, <laughs> you know, these kinds of things, which were things that really took off during the pandemic, and so, you know, you have this whole industry that's trying to uh, trying to adapt to this new normal. And I think you're right. I don't think we're going back to normal. I think we have a new normal and we just kind of need to figure out what that is going forward. And so certainly for the seafood industry, that's what, what, what I've seen is, you know, everyone's trying to figure out the new normal. Um, and, you know, some of it has been, has been negative, has been painful, you know, lost markets, lost employees, um, lost production opportunities. But some of it, you know, there are some, some bright spots too, with people establishing new marketing channels, figuring out, you know, okay, how can we get this product to people direct to consumer or through online methods? Do we need new technologies? Do we need new packaging? Do we need, you know, so all of these things I think are interesting opportunities going forward. And, 
you know, I, I really like that both the historical perspective, you know, what the history of the seafood industry has been traditionally, but then also how important relationships are, right? Where again, these, these current supply chains are really built around relationships. And so how do you have that going forward when we're all so remote, when we're all not together, you know? So I think it's, it's interesting. Um, and I'd say that's been kind of the, the biggest impact on, on our research and outreach parts of things is, you know, we're, we're still providing outreach to the industry extension information. We've just had to do that differently. We can't go out and see them. We have to do it over the phone. We have to do it over Zoom. We have to try and find ways to work with them. And, you know, some of the folks we work with don't even have a computer. So, you know, how do you kind of address those issues and those challenges? Um, and so that's, that's been how it's affected, I think, uh, our program at least. Uh, but certainly interesting trying to develop or identify what is the new normal uh, going forward. John. Sure. Um, I guess I'll first talk a little bit about um, the food supply chain in general. So um, Anna mentioned a lot of the ways that we uh, started to interact differently with our food. A lot of people started to bake more, started to do more home canning. Other people, um, I think, recognized that um, food may not be as available as it usually is and, and all more canned goods or more, more things that could go in the freezer more easily. Um, and this was this was due to a variety of factors. Um, it was due to just a consumer response, which was both rational in some ways, realizing that these shortages were existing and also a lot of what you might call panic buying. Um, it was also due to some differences in the way that food is normally distributed from how it's distributed um, now under this particular normal that we've been living in for the last year. So there's a lot less institutional dining. There's a lot less demand for milk. Um, going to schools, milk being sold in five gallon bags. Um, and certain, you know, certain types of vegetables are mostly sold in restaurants. As Jonathan mentioned, seafood is mostly consumed in restaurants. And so these differences in the way that we get our food led to some shocks at the grocery store. Um, but I think that the shortages that we saw, um, they, were, they were fairly quickly resolved. Um, there, were, there were lots of substitution opportunities available. I know my family um, responded to the, uh, the temporary shortages we saw at our local supermarket by subscribing to a CSA and buying some meat from that local farmer and, and a few other local farmers too. Um, but not everybody has those resources as Anna talked about. Um, food insecurity has been um, really a, a huge consequence of the pandemic. Um, um, according to one study that I saw, um, approximately 17 million more Americans are food insecure as a result. And when we think about global impacts, it's, it can be even worse in other countries. One of my colleagues, um, Anubhav Gupta, did a study in West Bengal in India where they surveyed um, poor, poor people in this rural community um, in one particular part of West Bengal and found that um, their, their household income was reduced by 88% relative to pre-pandemic levels. So you can imagine they're already poor and then they only have 12% of their, of, their, of their normal income level. Um, and they also had a huge um, negative impact in terms of remittance income. And so, um, so those are some of the, the impacts, generally speaking. I'll also talk for a minute about um, the results of this uh, the early preliminary results of this study that I've been doing with Jonathan and several other colleagues, um, where we're looking at the impacts of COVID on Virginia farms and agribusinesses. So we sent out a survey. Um, we tried to reach many, many farmers, but didn't get as many responses as we would have hoped. Um, so we don't have a, a lot of confidence in the precision of the estimates. But anyway, we sent out the survey in September, around six months after the pandemic started here in the US from, from a commercial perspective. Um, and we, we estimate that Virginia farm producers lost somewhere between eight and 27% of their revenues compared to 2019 revenues. And at the same time, their cost increased by 10 to 23%. So um, all in all, that's a, that's a huge, huge negative impact on profits. Um, but we also found that effects varied widely across different types of farms. So Jonathan's, the industry that he works with so closely, aquaculture, they were hit the hardest of all beef and cattle producers who make up a lot of the smaller farmers in terms of their economic impact in the state. Um, that is to say their revenues from farming are already relatively low. Um, they were also hit by hard 
um, largely because of um, a lack of markets to, to sell um, their animals to for slaughter, um, at least temporarily. Um, we also found, on the other hand, though, that nurseries who, who do a lot of direct sales, and as Anna mentioned, people have gotten in, more into gardening and growing their food at home, nurseries tended to, to actually increase their revenue slightly during those first six months of the pandemic. Um, also, um, another dimension of inequality um, is, uh, according to our survey results, women who responded to our survey and uh, non-white farmers who responded had reported much worse impacts in terms of revenues and costs than men and white farmers. Um, I guess the other thing that I'll mention right now is uh, the impacts on my personal extension program. So I work a lot with extension agents um, and I think that they were a lot, uh, um, they, they faced a lot more challenges very quickly after the pandemic started in terms of trying to help their farmers find solutions for um, getting their, their products to market if, the, if their normal buyers weren't buying anymore. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of this depends on the supply chain. And if they grow vegetables that end up being processed in a way that restaurants demand, not in a way that the grocery store demands, um, they're gonna need to shift. And, um, you know, uh, there, basically there were, there were all kinds of unforeseeable um, challenges that, that farmers were facing that in turn extension agents were dealing with on the ground. Um, or over the phone or, or in an office with social distancing. Our agents were also really busy helping farmers to understand how they could uh, take advantage of the stimulus packages that were rolled out last year, um, pay, Paycheck Protection Program and, and other programs. Um, but then in terms of my personal extension program, I think that, I think that Zoom has actually been kind of a silver lining. Um, I, I, as I mentioned at the beginning, I have, I've been running this webinar series this semester um, and it was originally scheduled to be in person, but I think that our turnout has been um, quite, quite good um, and, and quite a bit better than it would be if it were in person. I've also been able to bring in people remotely. The last couple of weeks I've had um, colleagues from Ohio State and from Connecticut give presentations to our clientele here in, in Virginia. Um, and so that's been an advantage. Um, so yeah, okay, I, I think, I think that's that's all I'll say for now. Oh, Thanks. That's great. So I'm going to jump ahead because, and I think we can tackle this at both. So you you have all touched on some long term consequences of COVID, and I, I'd like you to amplify your thoughts on that, and then some lessons we can take from what we're learning in the pandemic. That uh, practice, you you know, John just mentioned the the use of Zoom for you know, a different model of extension and that having some positive consequences. And we're certainly seeing that with programming, some of our programming, we can bring in much larger audiences than we might have with a face-to-face -face type of event. So what do, you, what do you think we're gonna take forward here, both for good and ill? And what have we learned that maybe, if God forbid, we ever have to navigate a world disrupting event of this magnitude again in our lifetimes, that we can uh, maybe not replicate some of the same challenges. Anna, you want to go first? Sure. Big questions, <laughs> lots of um, responsibility. I feel like I, I go back and forth personally between my optimism and pessimism about <laughs> what we have learned and whether it's anything. Um, <clears throat> I do think that this is a, you know, a precursor to much larger crises, uh, both within public health and environmental issues and the intertwining of the two that we are in for, um, you know, for the rest of my life anyway, and that, you know, paying attention to what has gone well and what has gone poorly in this year will be very instructive in terms of how we structure our future responses um, as we deal with climate change mitigation, um, all of the resulting political and economic fallout that comes along with, with those um, future and ongoing crises. I think that there's something about a crisis that can be very beneficial to forcing change. And I think that we are, we are living and will continue to see what those are. Um, you know, I think that history as a discipline is very much <clears throat> looking to the past to recognize how moments of crisis and fissure have, have, 
have affected society, um, you know, whether that's with, within history of public health, like our organizer Tom Ewing looks at, or, or other past epidemics and how much those can, can really stimulate changes in public health infrastructure, a recognition that the patterns that we often fall into and the, and the normal we take to be normal, you know, last year before this pandemic began wasn't a forever normal, it had been the new normal for that phase of time, right? And that recognizing that the patterns we fall into because of the past are not necessarily, you know, <clears throat> dictating the present, that we have space for change, that the way our society structure is structured is the result of past choices and that present choices can alter, you know, the paths forward. And I do think that the kind of rupture that we've seen in all dimensions has done that for some people, you know, across different topics. I think the fact that the uh, racial justice protests came out in the way they did last summer was not separate from COVID, but in fact, part of a sense of what's, what, what problems are at the root of the way our structure is, is our society is structured and how can we address those. <clears throat> so I'm hopeful in the sense that I do think that this moment of rupture can open space just for reconsideration of all kinds of, you know, policies and, and pro proposals across the board. Um, you know, one small, relatively small one <clears throat> within sort of food policy I, I've been following is about, you know, the school lunch program and how universal school lunch had for so long been <clears throat> a goal of many people who work in, in food security and it had always been kind of politically unthinkable that we would be able to pass a universal school lunch program. But because there were so many waivers over the past year to provide universal school lunch in the, like sort of for the crisis, now there's real traction politically for a universal school lunch program, meaning not only do you have to qualify for free and reduced lunch, but that this would be, you know, built into the public school system. And so I think that's one concrete example of the way that something that is allowed or seen as possible during a crisis moment can reshape the way we think about it in our in our more normal or, you know, future normal day to day. Um, you know, John mentioned the CSA boom, there's been this kind of major boom, and at least some of the commentators I've been reading suggest that they think that that's, that that's just not going to go away, that the, the kind of life that's been uh, given to some of these small and local farmers and people's sense of what it means to have food, local food sovereignty may carry into the future. Um, I also think public health as a broader model is now on our, on our minds in a way that it hasn't been in the past and recognizing how intimately tied public health is into all kinds of other systemic issues, whether that's thinking about, you know, meat production in terms of where COVID uh, the virus originated to thinking about just tensions between the ever present tensions between public health and individual liberties that have come up in the discussions around mask mandates and business closures. Um, those things kind of leave me a little less hopeful about the future in terms of recognizing just how large the divide is in our nation between what people rely on for authority and a sense of how to moderate their behavior in response to crisis. Um, you know, how, how, how many intervening institutions there are to prevent the expertise that we look to in terms of who do we trust. And I think that those divides are, you know, have, have not been so stark in a long time. Um, and that, you know, I think in terms of thinking about future crises, figuring out how to address that epistemic divide and that polarization and, you know, lack of coherent sense of authority is going to be the most important, um, you know, way. Um, just as a final thing, I'll say I also have been really heartened by the ways that other groups, mutual aid groups and community organizations have stepped in when that divide that I mentioned has blocked, you know, state or federal reg regulations to address some of these problems that individual people and groups have ra rallied together to help their communities in ways that I've found really, really beautiful in, in a wide range of spaces that I've observed. And so I do think thinking about mutual aid networks, local grassroots organizations and how they can step in to provide immediate support without the broader you know, bureaucracy and um, problems that can sometimes plague public policy, though that latter is also very needed. Um, so lots of scattered thoughts in all directions, but uh, some days I, I, I can smile and feel hopeful about what we've learned.
Thanks, Anna. William. Yeah, so again, I'll, I'll just briefly, a couple of things that I think are really interesting that's gonna play out big, like hugely in the future is the need for people to be autonomous, like to, for employees to be autonomous. And I think the problem is, again, I, as a parent of a teenager, I think our education system is now woefully, and this has really exposed some problems in our education system, I think particularly in secondary, but maybe also at the undergrad level, where we don't prepare people to be autonomous learners and autonomous doers. Uh, our high school system is based on you go to school class, the teacher tells you what to do, you do it. And again, watching a senior you know, go through this past year, I don't think she's learned anything and certainly not to be autonomous. Um, and what we see in the, the workers who have really th thrived, are those people are kind of naturally autonomous. So sometimes we have to find a way to, to change our education system to to reward autonomy and teach autonomy and teach people how to uh, not just do what they're told and to, to seek problems and try and solve those problems. And um, I think that's gonna be something as, as you know, this, the workforce is gonna change and our work systems are gonna change. And, you know, people like autonomy, but we don't always know how to manage it. And I think that's gonna be a skill we really need to start teaching much earlier uh, and, and I think the flip side of that is, uh, as I mentioned before, our leaderships, our leaders aren't very well, uh, you know, equipped to deal with autonomous workers either. Um, and so we, at the same time, and this is something I really try and do in my uh, MBA teaching is to um, kind of break them away from lists and managing, you know, by objectives and things, but instead to really empower their employees and give them goals and involve them and, reward the people who really take that and run with it and coach the people who struggle with it. And that's a very different way of, of leading and managing than a lot of organizations are used to. And I think um, this, this, the whole COVID thing is, is really stressed that things are gonna to have to change and things will change and that uh, we need to start preparing our students for that and that our organizations are gonna, you know, the organizations that survive and thrive in these kind of crises will be the ones who embrace that. Um, and so I, I think it's gonna be really interesting um, as we move forward, so. Thanks, William. Great. Jonathan. Yeah, I, I, I guess for, uh, in terms of long-term consequences, well, you know, it's interesting, Anna mentioned, you know, changing consumer behaviors. And, and so we see that too with the seafood industry. Uh, you know, there actually has been an uptick of at-home consumption of seafood during COVID, um, which has been great. I mean, not just for the industry, but also from a public health perspective, because there are health benefits of a seafood diet. Um, you know, in the U.S., we've we've always been underneath the recommended threshold uh, for uh, seafood consumption. So, you know, it's good to see that there's been some development there that people are eating more seafood at home. And so obviously hoping that, that that is a permanent shift, not, not a temporary one, but uh, time will tell. You know, I think in terms of thinking long-term, you know, it's, um, there's a lot of things we need to learn from, from what happened in the pandemic. There's a lot of stuff we don't quite yet have figured out, you know, what some of these effects are. I think we're in the process of quantifying, uh, you know, and, and putting those into context right now with a lot of things. You know, again, I, I mentioned earlier, there were a lot of negative things that happened, a lot of negative spillovers, a lot of impacts on businesses and people's lives. But I think there were also some positive things that happened. And so I think we need to kind of sit back and, and look at both of those um, and rethink business as usual, right? Rethink these structures that we built our society on, re these structures that we built our supply chains on, you know, are there better ways of going forward uh, than trying to go back to what we used to do before. And I think the answer is yes. I think there are most definitely better ways of going forward. And so trying to identify those and, and you know, and, and support industry and, and, you know, in my case, industry, I guess, into achieving that. Um, you know, the one thing I, I, I do want to mention also is I agree entirely that, you know, COVID was a, a, a unique um, you know, disruptive event because of a virus, a disease, which again, we all hope will not repeat. Um, 
although it's likely that it will at some point. But I think, you know, I look at it almost through the lens of this is preparing us for the much bigger challenge that is to come as a result of our changing climate. You know, and so looking at the lessons we can learn about resiliency in our food systems and our society from COVID might actually help to prepare us better for some of the challenges we face going forward as a result of climate change um, that, that's going to be affecting all of us around the world. And so the big lesson for me, and I think I hope everyone was, you know, we are all in this together. Everything is tied together. Everything is linked. You know, the supply chain, society, people, individual well-being, health. I mean, it's all tied together. And I think COVID really kind of drove that point home where an impact in one sector was felt throughout the entire, you know, economy and society somewhere else. And so I think that's really the lesson I hope people take going forward long term that, you know, we can't ignore these little impacts. We have to, we have to address this on a, on a, on, on a whole level uh, to be able to be able to withstand some of the challenges that are coming our way. Thank you. And John. Sure. Well, I agree with everything that, that the three other folks on this panel have said. Um, and I think that especially um, what Anna what Anna was talking and was, was saying about um, communication about science and and potentially um, different ways that people obtain their information. She referred to uh, an epistemic divide. Um, it's really good for me to be participating in this interdisciplinary group today because I don't think I've used the word epistemic in a presentation in you know 10 years that I've been giving economics presentations. Um, so it's just it's just nice to hear um, you know all these different perspectives. But we're we're all we're all as Jonathan was just saying we're all in this together and we're all working to try to make the world better in the context of COVID and post COVID. Um, I think that as Jonathan and Anna both said, climate change um, is is going to be the problem that's that we're going to be dealing with for the rest of our lives, and that there are some lessons that we can learn in terms of communication about science and in terms of efforts around finding solutions, um, you know, sort of sort of working together across disciplinary boundaries, across um, public and private and, and, and um, you know, academia and industry. Um, so those are some of, some of the ways that I think that we can take, take lessons from, from what's, what we've done with COVID um, into the future. I also want to mention, um, I mean, it just I, I feel like one of the biggest problems that we face, and I don't, this is not based on my research, this is based on my reading and, and my perceptions, but I, I think that um, um, skepticism towards science has revealed itself both in terms of um, the ways that people refuse to comply with social distancing guidelines or laws, and also um, our vaccine hesitancy. Now, um, we definitely anticipate that a large share of the US population, the global population will refuse to take vaccines, um, despite science indicating that they are very safe with, with the exception of some side effects and that um, some, I mean, yeah, some side effects, I'll just leave it at that. Um, but these side effects are rare and, um, and, and they've been approved by the appropriate regulatory bodies. We should all take them for our own health and to protect others. Um, but because there's so much mistrust in science in general and the academic community and the government, um, it's gonna be hard to convince everybody to take the vaccine. And as over the years, we may be fighting, um, you know, hundreds of, or thousands of variants of COVID, which may um, be um, may be stronger than the vaccine. I, I'm, not, I'm not a biologist, I don't know the exact terms that I should be using, but the vaccines won't be able to prevent all forms of coronavirus variants that may evolve. Um, and so given that, it's important that something more like 99% of the population take, take the vaccines when they're available um, and take each version of the vaccine as they become available over the years um, instead of you know 60 or 70%. Um, I guess the other thing that I'd say is just, um, I feel very grateful to be living in, um, in Blacksburg and to be able to work from home um, and that I've kept my job, that my family hasn't suffered from COVID um, in terms of their health. But um, it's really, um, I mean, the biggest impacts are, are 
uh, felt by other people who, who live in different life circumstances than me. Um, almost three, 3 million people have died around the world, maybe more if you, if you consider um, uh, deaths that were not formally counted as COVID. Um, millions and millions of people have lost their jobs in the last year in the US alone. And food insecurity is something that, um, that we've talked about a little bit throughout, but it's something that has both immediate and long-term impacts. Um, mental health problems that may arise because of isolation during COVID may have very long run impacts, um, including suicide. But, but I mean, it's kind of like um, people living with PTSD and we just haven't been able to see the long-term effects yet. But I think that um, all of the short-term effects that we've seen in the last year will have effects down the road in terms of people's well-being, and um, and unfortunately, that's that's I think the the, the most important legacy of COVID. Great, thank you for that. So, if there are any questions from people in the audience, please put those in the chat room and. Uh, if you all have questions for one another, we can certainly entertain those as well. I have a question for William, uh, because I thought it was so interesting. You mentioned the finding about people who practice mindfulness being less you know, re resilient in this moment, because I had just seen like the last page of the Atlantic magazine this month's issue was some, you know, a guy who'd practiced meditation for a very long time saying this year he had given up his daily practice um, because I mean, he didn't exactly say what, I mean, something about wanting to sit with all the divergent thoughts in his head and not, you know, not be, not be so present for it in a way. But I just, I find that really interesting from a mental health perspective in terms of what people do. It seems like the, on the one hand, people have been, so many people have dealt, been dealing with depression and mental illness and isolation. And on the other, you hear reports of people who are some ways happier this year, whether it's because they're introverted and just like being home alone or, you know, find the routine of not having to, you know, commute other things. And so, but, but I kind of like, what's the difference I have, even among my friends, I feel like there's such a wide divide between people who are kind of doing okay. And the people who are really struggling. And so thinking about, I, I know this isn't, it's a big question that's not exactly your research, but that little tidbit about like, well, what can we do as we are definitely going to be dealing with all these crises on an individual level to keep ourselves, you know, happy or, or just at least functioning? Um, I wondered if you had more to say about that little piece of, of your findings. Yeah, I think, you know, some of it actually touches on what you were saying earlier. It's just, I think the media plays such a big role because we know, and I'll just go back to the, just pure emotions, there's so much negative emotion. And we know that negative emotions are like orders of magnitude stronger than positive emotions. So when all you're bombarded with is negative, 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 even in the, you know, all the other political things that were going on, it's like, where do you find the positivity, right? So if you're a mindfulness person, you're trying to be in the moment, there's just nothing in the moment to to like hang your hat on. And you don't see these, you know, positive stories of people reaching out as much. Um, and I think, you know, sometimes you know, I'm a strong introvert too, but there's, an, there's a limit, right? Like it's great at first. And then you start to realize, gosh, I need something and Zoom isn't cutting it. So I think um, those things have, have played out in, you know, just really unique ways. And uh, I think we need to get back to celebrating all these positive stories. And, and uh, again, to what John was saying about portraying science and just a very, even way instead of, you know, oh, it's like, it's all great or it's all bad. It's like, you know, there's just, I think just something's gone haywire in the media and society where we just, even the way people talk is no longer just reason and it's all emotion. And, and when you play that game, I think there's, again, long-term consequences that people don't think about and just the way we're wired for emotion and negative emotion just plays so strongly and we can't, can't deal with it for a year straight, right? Like, so I think um, there's gonna be long-term consequences to bear with this. And I think the media can, could play a big role in maybe helping us focus on the positive and, but we'll see, right? Like, um, hopefully things will get better. <laughs> like I say, it's maybe we just have to pay attention to each other and find our, and rally around our friends and close relationships, but uh, we're, we're all separated from them. So I think it's so, so hard. 
Well, this certainly occurred at a time in our history where it was a particularly divisive era in our political culture. And that where many of us might have formerly held a rather benign view of technology, we were seeing that there's some, some real fallout that is you know, the promotion of disinformation, the monetization of outrage and algorithms that keep, you know, in order to keep people hooked and have them look at more ads. And I think um, COVID has just amplified our having to come to grips with some of those trends along with uh, really uh, embedded structural inequalities that have arisen in our country and around the world. And um, I, you know, sometimes I'm very optimistic about where we go from here and other time I, I despair because it just seems so overwhelming. Um, but I think all of you have touched on a, a good wrap up question, which is what are some of the ways that a land grant institution like Virginia Tech might help us navigate to a, a better future? I mean, what is the role that we can play in, for instance, addressing uh, science illiteracy and, and helping people understand uh, the role of the media and technology. Ana, you wanna take that and then we'll move on to the others? Sure. Um, well, I was just talking this morning with my students and um, teaching a history of agriculture class and we were talking about what the land, we were talking about the history of the land grant institutions and about Native American land dispossession and what land grant institutions you know what their history is, what their origin stories are, and what their duties are. Because and because I was asking my students if they have a sense of when they hear, you know, Virginia Tech materials or President Sands saying like our land grant mission, like what if that means something to them? Um, in that particular small sample, it didn't really. <laughs> but I was trying to kind of prod them to think about well, what is it that the way that we picture ourselves as this kind of institution that is embedded in our communities and has this sort of mission of engagement that, you know, John and Jonathan, at least with their work with extension, I think are so embedded in that part of the university and others, I think, you know, aren't as deeply embedded in, in community work in that same way. Um, but I mean, I think that the role can be very powerful. I think recognizing the way that <clears throat> institutions of higher education are in their best embodiment I think can be real institutions of a democratization when we think about the student body that we're attracting and and giving access to and the way that we then use our both our curricular and, and extracurricular resources to highlight um, the kind of most critical issues in our society. That's not to say that every class has to be turned to a you know contemporary activism class and yet I do think a lot about especially from my teaching, in my teaching role, I think about the ways that we can turn student assignments into um, more animated engagement projects, whether that's like in a history class, having them do oral histories of the present where they're like putting what's happening in this moment into some kind of um, context of awareness that, you know, just as we learn about the Dust Bowl and think about, you know, this crisis moment in the past um, that people's lives continued and that there were still, you know, joys and births and weddings in the midst of that crisis. And so too in this moment. So helping place this crisis in some ways into context that helps us feel less hopeless, um, that can maybe spur action, um, finding creative ways to, to think about these things. Um, I also think the institution has a, a role to play in public health, both mental and, and physical health, um, in terms of thinking about more campus counseling resources, more, you know, not lines out the door for students to be able to deal with some of these issues in a day to day way, and hopefully then take that into their lives and careers beyond. Um, and then, you know, the role of extension, I think, is really interesting. And I'd, I'd love to hear that the panelists talk more about it. But I think that uh, and my colleague Nick Copeland in sociology and American Indian studies has been talking uh, about cooperative extension as a model that can be expanded beyond what it's traditionally served to further extend the findings and, and knowledge of this institution into the community across all kinds of dimensions that infrastructure is there. And how do we think creatively about perhaps using those levels of expertise beyond kind of the agricultural sector to extend um, our, our wealth and resources into the community. And I, I mean, to me, that feels like so overdue that kind of conversation and makes, you know, me hopeful about what 
the work I'm doing might mean to someone beyond, you know, the few people who read my book or take my classes. So um, I'm, yeah, I, I think that there is a lot of promise for expanding the mission in that way. Perfect. John or Jonathan, do you have anything to add to that? Sure, I'll go ahead and um, I'll just say that, um, well, I've been in an extension role for the last four and a half years um, since I started my first faculty job. And I have um, really cherished that role as a formal part of my um, job description uh, because I have always viewed economics research that um, engages with the public, that's understandable to the public, and, and, and that's meaningful um, to people outside of academia to be, to be sort of integral to my work. And I, I try really hard to identify research questions that would be interesting to people outside of academia and also to write my, my journal articles in a way that um, will be mostly understandable um, to, to people um, you know, in, from different disciplines, from different walks of life. Um, that's my goal. And so for me, extension is, is, is a, sort of a way of formalizing um, my engagement um, through my research. Um, but I think that it's, I think that I would, I would hope that my colleagues, no matter whether they have an extension appointment or not, would view um, public communication as a priority and, um, you know, take the same sort of philosophy in terms of identifying research topics and the way that papers are written so that, um, so that everything can be accessible and also interesting and, and meaningful and valuable to, um, to the public at large. And, and, you know, a lot of what we do is about farmers, but a lot, of, a lot of what we do in cows is about farmers, but a lot of what I do personally is about consumers and we're all consumers of food. Um, um, you know, there, sorry, um, Dean Belmonte, there was something else on my mind in answering this question, but um, I've forgotten it and I know we're running out of time. So I think I'll, I'll okay. stop no, that, here. That was great. And Jonathan will give you the last word. Oh. Yeah, so actually to you know kind of follow up on on what John was saying, I think you know I, I too cherish having the 50-50 extension research split. I think you know that's kind of put us in a position where you know we work on applied uh, issues that are affecting people. That's kind of what we were doing before COVID. You know, before the pandemic, we were addressing industry challenges, issues with stakeholders were having, and you know designing our research around that. And the entire mentality, the entire thinking process of developing outputs, deliverables, information that's readily accessible to the people that are, you know, our stakeholders and our stakeholders run from, you know, the individual farmer all the way to state and federal policymakers and just the public at large in some cases. So having that, I think, certainly, you know, somewhat prepared us on, on how to, you know, communicate through the uh, pandemic, you know, to, with, with our stakeholders. Um, and to that point, I think, you know, like Anna and, and, and William mentioned, I think that's something we need to get better at. You know, I mean, we, we need to look at how people are communicating these days, what are the predominant forms of communication and where are people getting their information? And, you know, we need to be better at communicating science through those channels is what I think. You know, I think we're, we have a lot of valuable information that's available but it's not reaching the public at large, you know? And I think it's figuring out how we can package our information in a way that makes it attractive and interesting, but also meaningful to people when they, when they receive it um, so that they wanna receive it, right? And that um, may, you know, maybe, maybe journal articles is not the best way of doing that, even though those are important for us as academics, you know, that, that doesn't mean a whole lot to the public, I think, so. Well, thank you all for a terrific conversation. Um, our series continues on March 22nd, where my esteemed colleague, Robert Summercrest will be uh, our moderator. And um, you can find information about the other sessions in the chat room. There's also a really nice uh, piece with an overview of all the panelists and the topics in the series in today's edition of BT News. So thank you to our panelists for a really interesting, wide-ranging conversation and enjoy the rest of your Monday.